Uh, Swan's Way, starting at page 139. We stopped for a moment in front of the gate. Lilac time was nearly over. A few, still, poured forth in tall mauve chandeliers, the delicate bubbles of their flowers, but in many places among the leaves, where only a week before they had still been breaking in waves of fragrant foam, a hollow scum now withered, shrunken and dark, dry and odorless. My father, my grandfather, pointed out to my father how the look of the place had remained the same, and how it had changed since the walk we had taken with Monsieur Swan the day of his wife's death, and he used the occasion to tell the story of that walk one more time. In front of us, an avenue bordered by nasturiums climbed in full towards the sun, towards the house. To the right, the park extended over level ground, darkened by the shade of tall trees that surrounded it, an ornamental pond that had been dug by Swan's parents. But even in it, his most artificial creations, man is still working upon nature. Certain places will always impose their own particular empire on their surroundings, hoist their immemorable insignia in the middle of a park just as they would have done far from any human intervention. In a solitude which returns to surround them wherever they are, arising from the ex exigencies of the position they occupy and superimpose on the work of human hands. So it was that at the foot of the path that overlooked the artificial pond, there might be seen in its two rows woven of forget-me-nots and periwinkles, a natural crown, delicate and blue, encircling the chairs pure brow of water. So it was that the sword lily, bending its blades with a regal abandon, extended over the eupatorium and wet-footed frog bit the ragged fleur-de-lis, violet and yellow, of its lacustrine scepter. Mademoiselle Swan's departure, which, by taking from me the terrible chance that I might see her appear on a path, that I might be recognized and scorned by the privileged little girl who had Bergeau for a friend and went to visit the cathedrals with him, made the contemplation of Tansonville a matter of indifference to me for the first time it was allowed me seemed, on the contrary, to add to that estate, in the eyes of my grandfather and my father, certain accommodations, a transitory charm, and does for an excursion into mountain country the absence of any cloud, to make that day exceptionally favorable for a walk in that direction. I would have liked their calculations to be foiled, a miracle to make Mademoiselle Swan appear with her father so close to us that we would ha not have time to avoid her and would be obligated to make her acquaintance. And so when I suddenly saw on the grass, like a sign of her possible presence, a creel sitting forgotten next to a line whose bob was floating on the water, I hastened to turn my father's and grandfather's eyes away in another direction. In any case, since Swan had told us it was bad of him to go off because he had family at the house just now, the line could belong to one of his guests. We heard no sound of steps on the avenues, dividing the height of an unknown tree, an invisible bird contriving to make the day seem short, explored the surrounding solitude with one prolonged note, but received from it a retort so unanimous, a repercussion so redoubled by silence and immobility, that one felt it had arrested forever that moment which it had been trying to make pass more quickly. The light fell so implacably from the still sky that, that one would have wanted to elude its attention, and the dormant water itself, whose sleep was perpetually irritated by insects, dreaming no doubt of some imaginary maelstrom, increased the disturbance into which I had been plunged by the side of the cork float by appearing to draw it at full speed over the silent reaches of the reflected sky, almost vertical, it seemed, about to dive. And I was already wondering if, quite beyond my desire to know her and my fear of knowing her, I did not have a duty to warn Mademoiselle Swan that the fish was biting. 
and when I had to run to rejoin my father and grandfather, who were calling me, surprised that I had not followed them along the little lane they had already entered, which leads up into the fields, I found it humming with smells of the hawthorns. The hedge formed a series of chapels that disappeared under the litter of their flowers, heaped into wayside altars. Below them, the sun was laying down a grid of brightness on the ground as if it had just passed through a stained glass window. Their perfume spread as unctuous and delimited on its form as if I were standing before the altar of the Virgin and the flowers themselves adorned also each held out with a distracted air, its sparkling bunch of stamens, delicate radiating ribs in the flamboyant style like those which in the church perforated the bal balustrade of the rude screen of, or the mullions of the windows and blossomed out into the white flesh of a strawberry flower. How naive and folksy by comparison would seem the sweet briars which in a few weeks would climb in the full sun the same country lane in the smooth silk of their blushing bodices undone by a breath but though i remained here in front of the hawthorns breathing in bringing into the presence of my thoughts which did not know what to do with it then losing and finding again their invisible and unchanging smell absorbing myself in the rhythm that tossed their flowers here and there with youthful high spirits and at an unexpected intervals like certain intervals in music they offered me the same charm endlessly and with an inexhaustible profusion but without letting me study it more deeply like the melodies you replay a hundred times in succession without descending further into their secrets i turned away from them for a moment to accost them again with renewed strength. I pursued all the way on to the embankment behind the hedge that rose steeply forward toward the, f the fields. Some lost poppy, a few cornflowers, which had lazily stayed behind, which decorated it here and there with their flower heads like the border of a tapestry on which there appears thinly scattered the rustic motif that will dominate the panel. Infrequent still, spaced apart like the isolated houses that announced the approach of a village, they announced to me the immense expanse, where the wheat breaks in waves, where the clouds fleece, and the sight of a single poppy hoisting its red flame to the top of its ropes and whipping it in the air above its greasy black buoy made my heart pound like the heart of a traveler who spies on a lowland a first beached boat being repaired by a caulker and before catching sight of it cries out the sea then i came to stand in front of the hawthorns as you do in front of those masterpieces which you think you will be able to see more clearly when you have stopped looking at them for a moment but although i formed a screen for myself with my hands so that i would have only them before my eyes th the feeling they awakened in me remained obscure and vague seeking in vain to detach itself to come and adhere to their flowers they did not help me to clarify it and when i could not ask other flowers to satisfy it and i could not ask other flowers to satisfy it then filling me with a joy we feel when we see a work by our favorite painter that is different from the ones we knew or if someone takes us up to a painting of which we had until then seen only a pencil pencil sketch if a piece heard only by piano appears to us later clothed in the colors of the orchestra my grandfather calling me and pointing to tanzanville hedge said to me you love hawthorns just look at this pink one it's lovely isn't it Indeed, it was a hawthorn, but a pink hawthorn, even more beautiful than the white ones. It, too, wore finery for a holiday, for the only true holidays, which are the religious holidays, since they are not assigned by some fortuitous whim, are as the secular holidays to an ordinary day that is not especially intended for them, that has nothing essentially festal about it, but their finery was even more opulent for the flowers attached to the branch one above another 
in such a way as to leave no spot that was not decorated, like pom-poms garlanding a rococo shepherd's crook were in color and consequently of superior quality to the aesthetics of Combray. If one judged it by the scale of prices in the store in the square, or at Camus's, where the more expensive sponge cakes were the pink ones. Even I preferred cream cheese when it was pink, when I had been all allowed when I had been allowed to crush strawberries in it and these flowers had chosen precisely the color of an edible thing, or of a delicate embellishment to an outfit for an important holiday, one of those colors which, because they offer children the reason for their superiority, seem most obviously beautiful to the eyes of ch children, and for that reason will always seem more vivid than more, and more natural to them than the other tints, even after children have learned that they did not promise anything for the appetite and had not been chosen by the dressmaker. And certainly, I had felt it once, as I had felt in front of the white hawthorns, but with more wonder, that it was no artificial manner, and by no device of human fabrication that the festive intention of the flowers was expressed, but the nature that had spontaneously expressed it, with the naivety of a village shop keeper laboring over her wayside altar by overloading these the shrub with these rosettes which were too delicate in their color and provincially pompadour in their style at the tops of the branches like those little rose bushes their pots hidden in lace paper whose thin spindles radiated from the altar on the major feast days Teamed with a thousand, teamed a thousand little buds of a paler tint, which revealed when they began to open as though at the bottom of a pink cup of pink marble, reds of a bloody tinge, and expressed even more than the flowers the particular irresistible essence of the hawthorn, which wherever it budded, wherever it was about to flower, could do so only in pink, inserted into the hedge but as different from it as a young girl in a party dress among people in everyday clothes who are staying at home. The shrub was already for Mary's month and seemed to form a part of it already, shining there, smiling in its fresh pink outfit, Catholic and delicious. Through the hedge, we could see the p within the park an avenue edged with jasmines, pansies, and verbenas. verbenas. Between which stocks opened their fresh purses of a pink as fragrant and faded as an old piece of cordovan leather, while a long green painted watering hose, uncoiling its loops over the gravel, sent up at each of the points where it was punctured over the flowers whose fragrances it imbibed, the prismatic vertical fan of its multicolored droplets. Suddenly I stopped, I could not move. As happens when something we see does not merely address our eyes, but requires a deeper kind of perception and possesses our entire being. A little girl with reddish blonde hair, who appeared to be coming back from a walk, and held a gardening spade in her hand, was looking at us, lifting toward us a face scattered with pink freckles. Her dark eyes shone, and since I did not know then, nor have I learned since, how to reduce a strong impression to its objective elements, since I did not have enough power of observation, as they say, to isolate the notion of color. For a long time afterward, whenever I thought of her again, the memory of their brilliance would immediately present to me as that of a vivid azure, since she was blonde so that perhaps if she did not have such dark eyes which struck one so the first time one saw her, I would not have been as I was in love, most particularly with her blue eyes. I looked at her at first with the sort of gaze that is not merely the messenger of the eyes, but a window at which all the senses lean out, anxious and petrified, a gaze which would like to touch the body it is looking at, capture it, take it away, and the soul along with it. Then so I, 
fact. Then, so afraid was I that at any second my grandfather and my father, noticing the girl, would send me off, telling me to run on a little ahead of them with a second sort of gaze. One that was unconsciously supplicating, that tried to force her to pay attention to me, to know me. She cast her eyes forward and the sidewalk... Uh, she cast her eyes forward and sideways in order to take stock of my grandfather and father, and no doubt the impression she formed of them was that we were absurd, for she turned away and with an indifference and disdainful look placed herself at an angle to spare her face from being in their field of vision, and while they, continuing to walk on without noticing her, passed beyond me, she allowed her glances to stream out at full length in my direction without any particular expression, without appearing to see me. But with a concentration and a secret smile that only I could interpret, according to the notions of good breeding instilled in me, as a sign of insulting contempt. And at the same time, her hand outstretched in an indecent gesture for which, when it was directed in public at a person one did not know, the little dictionary of manners I carried inside me supplied only one meeting, that of intentional insolence. Gilbert, come here. What are you doing? Came the piercing, authoritarian cry of a lady in white whom I had not seen, while at some distance from her a gentleman dressed in twilm whom I did not know stared at me with eyes that started from his head. The girl abruptly stopped smiling, took her spade, and went away without turning back toward me, with an air that was submissive, inscrutable, and sly. So it was that this name, Gilbert, passed by close to me, given like a talisman that might one day enable me to find this girl again, whom it had just turned into a person, and who, a moment before, had been merely an uncertain image. Thus it passed, spoken over the jasmines and the stalks, as sour and as cool as the drops from the green watering hose, impregnating, coloring the portions of pure air that it had crossed, and that it isolated with the mystery of the life of the girl it designated for the happy creatures who lived, who traveled in her company, deploying under the pink thicket at the height of my shoulder, the quiescence of their familiarity, for me so painful, with her and the unknown territory of her life which I would never be able to enter. For a moment, as we moved away, my grandfather mutter mummering, Poor Swan, what a role they make to play of him. What a role they make him play. They make him leave so that she can stay here alone with her shadows. Because it was him, I recognized him and the little girl mixed up in that disgraceful business. The impression left in me by the despotic tone with which Gilbert's mother had spoken to her without her answering back by presenting her to me as some one obliged to obey another person, as not being superior to everything in the world, calmed my suffering a little, restored some of my hope, and diminished my love. But very soon that love welled up in me again like a reaction by which my humiliated heart was trying to put itself on the same level as Gilbert, or bring her down to its own. I loved her. I was sorry I had not had the time or the inspiration to insult her, hurt her, and force her to remember me. I thought her so beautiful that I wished I could retrace my steps and shout at her with a shrug of my shoulders, I think you're ugly, I think you're grotesque, I loathe you. But I went away, carrying with me forever as the first example of a certain type of happiness inaccessible to children of my kind because of certain laws of nature impossible to transgress. The image of a little girl with red hair, her skin scattered with pink freckles, holding a spade and smiling as she cast at me a long, cunning, and inexpressive glance. And already the charm with which the incense of her name had imbued that place under the pink hawthorns, where it had been heard by her and by me together, 
was beginning to reach, to overlay, to perfume everything that had that came near it. Her grandparents, whom my own had the ineff ineffable happiness of knowing, the sublime profession of stockbroker, stock the herring neighbor of the Champs Elysees, where she lived in Paris. That's page 146, and that's where I'm ending today.